Hello, and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm Adiola Adejobi. And I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. The MBBA is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. The goal of Raising the Bar with the MBBA is to identify justice issues affecting our communities while trying to identify some solutions in the process. Today on Raising the Bar, we are going to talk about the legalization of marijuana. Our guests are Lance Clark, partner with Bernstein Clark and Matowitz, and Esrae Onadewan, principal with the law offices of Onadewan and DeLintz LLC. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for, for having, having us. All right, so this is a very uh, timely topic. Um, certainly, we just had the, uh, the budget that was passed in, uh, on April 1st. I know that we still have a little bit of time before the, um, the session is over uh, with the state and assembly and the legislature. And one of the topics that has been talked about is legalization of marijuana. So uh, one of the issues, especially, I guess maybe give it a little bit of context, can we talk a little bit about the role that the, um, the prosecution and the criminalization of, legal, of marijuana has had, especially on folks of color? Right. You know, just from the onset, I think that there's a selective enforcement, selective prosecution, and selective incarceration in terms of marijuana. I say that to say that not everyone who smokes marijuana is arrested for smoking marijuana. And not everyone who smokes marijuana but is arrested for marijuana is prosecuted the same way. And not everyone who smokes marijuana and is arrested for marijuana and is prosecuted for marijuana is incarcerated at the same rate. And I believe prosecutors have a lot of discretion in this, and as well as judges. And, but it starts with law enforcement. You know, if you're in the Lower East Side and you're smoking you know, marijuana outside of your you know, hips to the bar, that, that's okay sort of. But if you're in Harlem or in Washington Heights or a predominantly uh, socioeconomically de uh, disenfranchised neighborhood, then, you know, they're taking you in. And they have the discretion whether to give you a desk appearance ticket or whether to put you through the system. And as someone who worked um, at the Legal Aid Society for about eight years before private practice, the predominant people who I've seen come through the system were people who look like me, Ezra, and, and you guys. And you can't tell me that the only people who smoke marijuana look like us. But yet and still, we are predominantly the majority of the people who are arrested for that same offense. And just to touch on what Lance was saying, uh, you know, in uh, 2010, the ACLU did some research and they took statistics between 2001 and 2010. And what they found was that uh, black people, uh, people of color, and white people smoke marijuana at the same rates, right? But what was interesting was that people of color were four times more likely to be arrested uh, than white people for possessing marijuana in public or smoking marijuana. And uh, also to Lance's point, I think there is a um, level of discretion that does exist now that is not codified, that um, does not appear in legislation, that is not exercised, and that first barrier is law enforcement. Lance touched on the point of uh, receiving a summons versus being arrested versus getting a desk appearance ticket. Law enforcement at the onset can make the decision as to whether or not they will arrest someone, meaning take, uh, take them in, process them, hold them, um, make them go through central booking, and appear in front of a judge for possession of marijuana or hand them a summons, which you know has the same effect as a ticket that lets them know they have to appear in court at a later date and a later time, but that person gets to go home to their family. So um, the prosecution of marijuana in the past, uh, it's my opinion, my personal opinion, it has had devastating um, effects on communities of color. It has been uh, the precursor to mostly stop and frisk uh, uh, that have been taking place in communities of color. Now that we don't have stop and frisk anymore, now it's the odor of marijuana, you know, that, 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 um, that begins every arrest um, for people of color. It's the odor of marijuana. Yeah, and actually that's a, uh, an important point that maybe we even want to flesh out a little bit because certainly over the last few years, um, stop and frisk has been deemed to be unconstitutional. In a lot of ways, uh, 
people would be stopped is they would you know stop them maybe under some dubious um, circumstances but if they were able to find that they had some type of marijuana or some other type of, uh, of drug on them then they would use that in some way to substantiate you know a gut feeling or whatever it is that right. folks would use um, what are how, I guess now that stop and frisk has um, is no longer uh, permitted you know, how has marijuana still been used? And I know you started talking about it a little bit when it comes to odor, but can we talk a little bit more about um, what it's like today? Well, I, I'll, I'll say that stop and frisk is still constitutional. It was the application that was deemed unconstitutional right, and how right, they yes. were applying it. And what that would mean is if they saw someone who looked like me who wasn't wearing the suit at the time, they would apply stop and frisk to me just for any reason to see you know, like when you said a gut feeling, he looks like he has something on him. That was the predicate for a lot of stops, which turned into resisting arrest because you, you're asking the police officer, why are you stopping me? And when you look at the penal code for resisting arrest, if the police officer says, put your hands behind your back, and you say, what did I do? Now you're flaring your hands. And now that goes into the criminal complaint. And now you're in jail for a misdemeanor and bail is being sent, depend, set, I apologize, uh, depending on whatever criminal history you may or may not have. So, you know, this marijuana possession has spiraled into an ugly beast that has ruined the lives and families of many, many people. Um, and just to touch upon uh, what Lance was saying, and to your point, um, the elimination, uh, and I, I'm not saying this is what you're saying, but this is, from what you're saying, this is my opinion, Marijuana has now kind of creeped in and taken the place of stop and frisk because I, I can't tell you the countless uh, arrests that I've encountered where, you know, my client is arrested and the only charge is possession, one bag, you know, and, and the dialogue usually goes, what do you have on you? Nothing. And they go into the pockets. So even though the bag was obtained illegally, the search was not uh, a good search, as we would say. It somehow it's like the ends justify the means. So the bag, the person is now charged with possession of that one bag, and that's that's it. That's all there is to that case. But but the collateral consequences from that are so great. It's like a ripple effect. As we touched on something really important, you know, when the police officer stops you and says, "What do you have in your uh, in your pocket?" While the bag of marijuana is in your pocket, it's a violation. But once you pull the bag of marijuana out, then they're charging you with the misdemeanor. But then they were asking you to take it out your pocket. So when you pulled it out, at the behest of law enforcement, now the charge is up, and it went from 15-day maximum uh, incarceration to, was it 30 days for marijuana? I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, this was just insane how they, what they were doing to people. They would literally go into housing projects, stop people, ask them what's in their pocket, no predicate for the stop. And then when the person pulled out a bag of weed, then charged them, processed them through Central Booker, those people weren't getting desk appearance tickets. They had to sit in jail for 24, sometimes 36 hours, and then maybe have a judge release them ROR or bail was set on marijuana. So once someone is uh, charged with uh, uh, marijuana possession, and they're put into the system, then what happens next? I mean, what happens to their uh, to their ability to be able to get jobs or, you know, what record stays so, with them? Marijuana is, um, in New York State, if, so we'll play this out, somebody gets arrested, charged with possession, and some, some places of employment, while that charge is pending, you know, won't hire you or won't, or you I've seen employers um, temporarily suspend some of my clients until they see the outcome of this case. If you, if it turns into a conviction just for simple possession, it jeopardizes for students, scholarships, uh, potential loans. Um, that is a criminal conviction in the state of New York. So um, I know that, you know, New York is working on the whole ban the box. You can't ask people if they, you know, um, during um, employment, if they have um, uh, criminal records. But it still makes it very difficult to gain employment for one conviction for possession of marijuana, one bag. Right. The housing, NYCHA yeah. would kick you yeah. out right. for possession of marijuana. So and then your mother would have to tell you, I'm sorry, baby, you can't live here anymore because if you're on the lease, I'm going to lose my apartment because you were stopped illegally for one bag of marijuana. 
No, that, and, and, that, and I'm glad you brought that up because from uh, when I, I also worked at the Legal Aid Society and a large, well, all of our clients um, were people that uh, could not afford their own attorneys. And it would be terrible to see a grandmother and a grandson living in a particular housing project. And this grandmother, either she would have to risk being evicted from her own apartment, right, this elderly woman, or tell her 17-year-old, 18-year-old grandson, go find somewhere else mm -hmm. to live because of this marijuana um, possession conviction, you can't live here. Right. It te literally tears families apart. It's a sort of soulless job that you do when you are giving people criminal records for possession of marijuana. One of my first trials when years ago when I was younger um, was a young man who was working not too far from here and he went out and smoked weed on his lunch break and he was arrested and I was you know negotiating with the prosecutor begging the prosecutor don't he didn't have a criminal record don't give him a criminal record please we'll do anything you want 50 days community service we'll do whatever you want just please don't give this man a criminal record because he's going to lose his job and he's going to lose his housing the prosecutor's exact words to me were this is not the first time he's been arrested for this it's time for him to get a criminal record it is time for him to get a criminal record those words have never ever left my mind and we went to trial the police officer came and testified. I saw him smoking marijuana outside of the job, and that was enough for the judge to convict. The young man lost his job. I'm not sure if he lost housing because we didn't keep in touch too much after that, but the mere fact that he was smoking marijuana outside of his job caused him to lose his job and then effectively possibly lose his, you know, residence. I mean, what does that say about us as a society? Like, what are we doing? I think the importance of that also is that prosecutors have discretion. So let's say, you know, the law enforcement fails in that first line of what I, what in my head, what I call first line of defense in terms of using their discretion, they fail, right? And so now this uh, defendant now has a, um, a pending marijuana uh, possession charge. Prosecutors have discretion. Prosecutors are powerful. As, de as defense attorneys, we don't like to admit it, we don't like to say it too loud, but they're powerful because they're given, they're given so much discretion in terms of how to steer a case. So for example, Lance's client could have been offered mm -hmm. A violation or or I mean a repleter? a repleter anything that will prevent this young man from pleading guilty to a misdemeanor crime but in the prosecutor's discretion this prosecutor felt I, I mean I, I don't want to speak for him or her but felt as though this young man was not worthy of that and I think that is the problem that I have with the uh, marijuana possession convictions and uh, the well the drug laws in general in New York State but the, he couldn't exercise his discretion in a way in which if he felt as though it was his job to teach this young defendant a lesson, you know, there, it, there's like um, an oversurge, an abuse of power, and it only affects our communities, communities, communities of, color. of color. We're not given the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. of you're a young, you know, you're a young kid, you're exploring, it's okay to explore, you know. We're not given the benefit of the doubt Woodstock, Everybody was doing right, drugs everybody. in the seventies, right? But who came out with criminal convictions, drug mm -hmm. convictions, pursuant to Rockefeller drug laws when everybody was doing drugs in the sixties and seventies? I mean, I digress. <laughs> I could go. On. Just one thing, Ezra made a huge point about the prosecutors having so much power. At times they have more power than the judges. Yeah. Because yeah. the judge will talk to the prosecutor and say, maybe you shouldn't prosecute this case. Come on, the kid was only smoking weed. Come on, he only had a bag of weed. It's up to the prosecutor to make that decision if they're going to make an offer. The judge cannot make the prosecutor make an offer. These prosecutors have enormous amount of power. And, you know, with that great power, I would like to think comes great responsibility, but it's hard to tell. Yeah. And so, you know, with all of that <laughs> that we've talked about, can you talk about why um, the legalization of marijuana is, is important? I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I'll start bigger first. Um, I think it's important if done a certain way, right? I think that on the side of criminal justice reform, I think I actually believe that it is a part or a portion of social justice reform. But on the side of criminal justice reform, 
what it does for me is some it's a plan to stop criminalizing poverty or right. criminalizing uh, blackness or you know people of color and when we if if we legalize it if New York State goes in the direction then that eliminates the um, the the nonsense predicates for stops that have replaced stop and frisk right here's where I'm I'm split uh, the plan that was proposed in New York State and I'm not saying anything negative about it or anything I'm just pontificating right exactly. that's why we're here <laughs> um, the plan that was proposed the w as it is written I still see what has always been in legislature in case law there is no room for communities of color in that in in the proposed plan for legalization what do I mean there are there are clauses built into the proposal that remind me of Jim Crow. You can't have a criminal record, uh, you can't have a conviction or a criminal record and obtain a license um, for a dispensary or to sell, right? You have to uh, have your own land, right, in order to be able to participate. And that's what that sounds like to me is cutting out communities of color. For communities that have been disenfranchised, right, and that have been, I'm, I'm trying not to be too dramatic about it, but communities that have been disenfranchised, but it is, but it is dramatic, econ actually. economically stunted, right, purposefully, that the legalization um, proposal does not include us. It doesn't consider us. And it doesn't account for economic equities that need to be made in our communities that are necessary in our communities. And I'm not saying that, you know, as black folks, we sit there with our hands out, gimme, gimme, gimme. No. The, commu the, the communities of color in New York State, didn't, we didn't create this for ourselves. I mentioned the Rockefeller drug laws, the war on drugs. We all remember that. And can yes. you explain what the Rockefeller drug so laws are? So in the 70s, there was this push to be tough on drugs, we're, you know, we're gonna take a stand. And I think that grew out of, um, uh, uh, I wanna say, um, Nixon's law and order, you know, that whole law and order push. And what it did is it made simple possession. People, in, in, in layman's terms, people were going to jail for a really long time for small amounts of drugs, like really long time for small amounts of drugs. And the people that were being stopped and being charged prosecuted, kind of like what Lance was saying earlier, and after we get to prosecution, the incarceration, were people of, mostly people of color. So it just destroyed our communities, tore families apart. I mean, like, economic destruction that will take years to recover from. So here we are now, talking about legalizing the very thing that you use to condemn an entire community, and there is no carve out for economic equities for the same communities that you destroyed with this law. It's, See why I'm torn? No, it's, it's the way the law is written now, it's a smack in the face to every person of color who has been disenfranchised because of it. So you mean to tell me that the same people who said marijuana is a gateway drug, now they want to be the connect. Right. Now they want to be the one out pushing the drug. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, when I was using that drug, oh, we have to put you in jail because you know what? That weed lead to crack. And when that crack, that leads to you burglarizing and robbing and killing people. So you know what? We have to be hard with this broken windows policy. When you smoking that weed, we got to put you in jail. Well, wait, I can make money off of that weed. You know what? We should legalize the marijuana, but then legalize it in a way that those people who are disenfranchised for using that marijuana, they are out of the system. They can't, they have no way to participate in the in any way of making themselves better in that uh, economy. So now we prosecuted you for this, we put you in jail for this, we ruined your family for this, and now we're gonna make money off of this. And, and I think also too, I think also too, in, for us to have an honest conversation about whether we legalize uh, recreational use, right, that's what we're talking about, there has to be, there has to be an examination on the disparate impact that it would have on communities of color. Whenever I, you know, whenever there are discussions about uh, different laws and, you know, the whole Second Amendment thing and everything, I listen to the conversation, but I know that for us, for people of color, 
there is another conversation that has to take place. So on its face, you can write whatever you want. I'm looking at the disparate impact on my community, and that will help me determine whether or not I stand behind a piece of legislation or not. Because nobody looks at us. Right, and in, 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 in terms of, because we're really talking about the way it's written now, but isn't it that there are some politicians that are pushing back, particularly those yes. that represent communities of color, yeah. Um, about the way it, it's being written. I think Hakeem Jeffries yes. spoke about that yes. as well. Jeffries did um, speak out uh, um, about that. And I know even, even uh, local churches are getting involved. Mm -hmm. And people are having this conversation because we see, we, we know, you know, we're, we're getting hip to, to, to the idea as to how this works. So what is the reason, if you know this, what is the reason why folks are saying that that has to be a component of any law that's passed regarding legalization of marijuana? You mean well, the economic equity? Why shouldn't it be the yeah. reason? Well, yeah, the convictions, right? I, I mean, why shouldn't it be the reason? You disproportionately ruin a generation right. of a certain group of people, and now that thing that you use to ruin a generation of people, you want to profit from. I think that if they, if, if there's no conversation where these poor black people are being compensated for what they had to go through, it's a non-starter in my book. How you, how you, how could you look yourself in the mirror and say that we criminalize this thing and we ruin your life, and now we want to make money off it and go to bed at night and sleep good and wake up in the morning and go to the bank and cash your check? Right. But is there a particular reason people are saying that needs to be there, like the ones who are the proponents of having that as part of the law? In, in all fairness, the, I think the same law is applicable when it comes to franchising and when it comes to alcohol licensing, that you can't have a criminal record mm -hmm. if you want to franchise a business and you can't have a criminal record if you want to have a, uh, an alcohol license. So I, I can see from that respect why it would be attributed to a marijuana license. but. It's very different in terms of marijuana because there are a group of people who have been adversely affected because of the over-prosecution for this very thing that the government has spent decades and decades of uh, standing on a, a platform saying why this thing is such a horrible thing. Um, and then when, just to Ezra's point, you speak of Jim Crow, when you, look at, when you look at keeping a group of people out because they have criminal records, you have to think about how those people got those criminal records. Right. N not all prosecutions are created equal. Not all crimes are created equal. Right. We all don't get prosecuted the same way as many would like to believe. I, I remember there was a study in the Times where a group of tourists came from Europe and they went to 100th Center Street and they were looking at arraignments. And they said, wow, this is great. So where do the white people get arrested? Where do they get arraigned? What it does to the mind of me and you, and when, when you are working in this system where everyone looks like you is being arrested for a crime, everyone that looks like you is being overly prosecuted, everyone that looks like you is being overly incarcerated, and you mean to tell me that we're the only ones committing the crimes? It's just me, it's just you, they only look like us? So how do we get those criminal records? And now that we have those criminal records and this booming business is starting to open up, and this is a capitalist society, at least I would like to think so, now I'm excluded from this capitalist business venture because I have a criminal record when someone who did the same exact crime as me does not, and now they have the opportunity to make money off of the back of my struggle? Right. And, and then, then you're gonna tell me that I'm just putting my <laughs> hands out and I want a free handout? Yeah. And then just quickly, because I know we're just about out of time, but when it comes to expungement of records, mm -hmm. is that just very quickly, Should you know, what's started? looked at there? So, two things. I, I, um, I talk about this a lot, the expungement. You know, New York State doesn't have expungement. They do sealing, mm -hmm. right? So they're sealing the records, not destroying it, which is what expungement is. For me, nobody asked me, but if, if you want my opinion, I'm, I'm not backing that bill unless there's a provision in there that says that people that have been convicted of marijuana possession, right, on any level, right, sounds crazy, those convictions get expunged. I'm not doing this ceiling thing. Right. It has to be expunged. The records must be destroyed. I think then we can start talking about social equities. Then we'll get closer to economic equities. You know, this is access to wealth. And in America, there are very few accesses to wealth. Mm -hmm. Real estate is one, and we saw what happened with communities of color with the real estate market. And now here is another one at the very beginning. So mm -hmm. expungement has to be expungement, not sealing. And, and, and really quickly, too, if you can add this into, into your closing. So, because I think the audience want to know, like, where are we with legislation right now? This, this has been proposed. <laughs> 
and that's it. No. <laughs> or or it what's happening? Anywhere. I think the black um, leaders and the yeah. politicians are putting their foot down yeah. as they should, yeah. mm -hmm. saying, no, if you want this, what are we getting out of it? Because yeah. we, you built this off the back of us. Like, like this whole entire country was built on the back of free labor. This, this whole thing was built on the back of the incarceration of people that look like everyone's sitting at this table. What are you going to do for us? We're nowhere. I think that the proposal was, uh, I, don't, I guess they're going back to the drawing board. I don't know. I just read an article uh, where uh, Cuomo's going to think about it. That was in, on March 19th, I think. But I don't think we're anywhere. And, yeah. I, well, the and, thing, and I think the good thing about that, too, really quickly, is that it still gives our communities uh, an opportunity, now that they're more informed yeah. through the show and other articles and things like that, to know what's happening and really push their representatives Absolutely. to push for what they want, Absolutely. particularly as it comes to this legislation. Absolutely. The dispensary should be in, you know, predominantly brown neighborhoods that were disenfranchised because of these laws, and they right. should hire people who have been disenfranchised because of these stringent marijuana laws. And there's one one more quick thing. There is a provision that that in the in um in the proposal that starts to get to the economic equities and that would be for people of color and I just uh, remembered it because Lance said where the dispensary should be, you know, the the rates on the, the interest rates on the potential business loans or yeah. loans. Um, yeah. Well, we would love to talk <laughs> more. You might have to do a part two on this one. And so, we get to wrap it up. But that's all the time that we have today. We want to thank our guests for being here with us today. And I want to thank you for watching Raising the Bar on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.